Next, on AM 1480 WLEA, the Newsmaker Show, here's Ryan O'Neill. Well, as predicted, after the 8 o'clock news, it's Dr. Gary Ostrower, uh, Alfred University history professor, longtime uh, AU history professor, on the line with us. Uh, Dr. Ostrower, speaking in predictions. I predict that the Democrats will be able to stall uh, and uh, keep things going so that, or, or at least be able to prevent uh, Brett Kavanaugh from getting on the Supreme Court. What's your prediction? I predict that Brett Kavanaugh is going to get onto the Supreme Court, and I suspect it's going to happen. Uh, he'll be confirmed by the Senate on Monday. Uh, it's going to be a close vote in the committee, that is to say the Judiciary Committee, when then recommends the nomination to the full Senate. Uh, I'm not sure when the full Senate will vote, but my guess is that it will be perhaps even as early as next Tuesday or Wednesday. Uh, but, you know, I'm not sure about this, and uh, it's a very, very volatile situation. So if, you, if I was giving odds, I'd say, yeah, 55% chance that he's going to get through and 45% chance that he's not. I'll tell you, Dr. Ostrower, this is a topic uh, not to bring up uh, with uh, relatives and friends at Thanksgiving if they don't agree with your views. I'm looking at the Facebook posts, and uh, you see a lot of the uh, conservative-leaning posts are saying that they're disgusted with the smear campaign from the Democrats. And uh, Democrat friends of mine on Facebook say they're disgusted that uh, Kavanaugh is being defended by conservatives. So you see that the... Uh, at, at the local level, uh, the conservatives are siding with Kavanaugh, and the liberals are siding against him. It's uh, it's, it's it seems like uh, emotions are very high on this one. Well, you know, we're in a period right now of American history where the kind of bipartisan politics that we have pretty much enjoyed throughout you know, 230 years of American history, that's really broken down. Now, I mean, you know, it's occasionally broken down at other times, and the most important example of that would be during the 1850s when bipartisan, when bipartisanship uh, over the slave issue eventually uh, you know, disappeared entirely, of course, and we wound up in a civil war. One certainly hopes that we don't get into that kind of a situation today. But, uh, you know, I think that President Trump, ha Trump has in some ways brought out the worst in us uh, in terms of, uh, you know, what a lot of observers are calling tribalism. So we're really not talking to each other. Uh, the idea of, you know, many of the major uh, pieces of administration, even during the Obama period, then that's before Trump was, you know, really on the scene, uh, were voted by almost uh, entirely either a Democratic uh, majority or a, Republic, a Republican majority. And I think that's what we have right here. It looks at, as if almost all of the Democrats, maybe all of them, uh, will vote against Kavanaugh. Almost all of the Republicans, probably all of them, will vote in favor, and that's why he'll get in. Uh, so the, you know, that, the, the, the bad feelings, you know, the hard feelings uh, that is being expressed on social media, uh, one shouldn't be surprised at all. But, you know, I mean, the, the Republicans are saying this is a smear campaign. I don't think it's a smear campaign at all. I think the guy has a rather checkered past. Uh, I don't think he was particularly honest with the committee, uh, at least in terms of what I heard uh, last Thursday when I was, uh, you know, listening to a good deal of the uh, uh, of the testimony. Uh, and I think that you know what Kavanaugh did was in some ways to take a leaf out of Trump's playbook by attacking the Democrats, not trying to say, hey, look, let's try to reason together. He accused the Democrats of smearing him. He accused them of, uh, you know, being kind of, uh, uh, you know, tools of the Clintons and, uh, and so forth. He suggested a conspiracy theory against him. Wow, I mean, there's zero evidence for that. You know, there's just zero evidence for that. But uh, you know, you make the charge, and then it's always difficult to uh, refute the charge. So, uh, and I think that in some ways what Kavanaugh was doing was really playing to an audience of one. And that audience of one was named uh, Donald Trump, and what he was trying to say to Trump is, don't abandon me. In spite of all these allegations, the Republicans must not abandon me. Dr. Ostra, um we started out with predictions. I was wondering... Uh, do you think any presidential uh, candidates will come out uh, as a result of the hearings? My predictions, if there are any, it would be a, a ticket like uh, Kamala Harris and uh, Cory Booker or Cory Booker and Kirsten Gillibrand. Do you have any thoughts there? 
Hard to say again. Uh, it, it, I think the one person, from my perspective, who really has come out with increased stature, and only one, uh, is uh, uh, Amy uh, Klobuchar, who is the uh, Democratic senator from uh, Minnesota. When she was attacked by uh, by uh, by Kavanaugh, when Kavanaugh, you know, she asked, asked a question about, you know, have you ever, uh, uh, you know, consumed alcohol to the point where you may have blanked out, where you may have simply, uh, uh, you know, passed out or blanked out, uh, and uh, blacked out, I guess, rather than blanked out. And, you know, he said, uh, uh, you know, he attacked her, you know, have you been drinking? You know, are, are you still drinking? And she explained, look, my father was an alcoholic. And I take this very, very seriously. You know, this isn't fun and games for me, she was essentially saying. And then he again, you know, asked the same question of her. Well, have you been drinking? Something to that effect. Uh, and she could have responded in a very, very angry and a very, very, you know, kind of personal way. And she did not do that. She really kept her cool. She was a consummate professional in the best sense of the word. And I think that registered with a lot of people, certainly with a lot of Democrats. Now, I've not heard her name mentioned. I was as just about to bring that up. But, uh, you know, could she become a presidential candidate or a vice presidential candidate? Perhaps. Uh, when we have Sean Hogan on the show, he says that the uh, people that are uh, holding up Kirsten Gillibrand's name are doing it, and they're doing it more so than she is. I think what Hogan thinks is... Uh, she makes an impression. She's on a lot of key committees, but she really isn't interested herself in running. I don't know if the same is true for Cory Booker, though. I think that Senator Booker is interested. Well, he may be, and I mean, I think that he's doing a little grandstanding here. The other day, you know, he uh, uh, said, I will, you know, release certain information that is otherwise classified, and even if this means I will be, uh, uh, I will be, uh, you know, forced to leave the Senate or forced to leave the committee, uh, I'm still willing to do that. I mean, you know, I, I don't think you do that kind of thing any more than I think that, uh, you know, Kavanaugh should have. Uh, attacked, you know, those people who are opposing his nomination or at least asking critical questions of his nomination. Uh, but, you know, I, I, we're, we're a long way. We're still two full years away from the uh, election of 2020, uh, you know, maybe a year away from people really declaring their candidacy. And I think perhaps that, you know, there's enough uncertainty that any of these people might declare. But, uh, you know, who the Democrats, I don't think the Democrats right now really have a candidate who is a credible uh, opponent of uh, President Trump. You know, as, mu as critical as I am about Trump, my hunch is that he's going to win the election. And he's going to win the election because the Democrats really do not have a very credible alternative. Uh, Biden, you know, Vice President Biden, former Vice President Biden, is too old. Uh, I think that many of these other people simply have not really established themselves. Uh, Avenatti, you know, that lawyer for uh, uh, Stormy Daniels, he's talking about running for president. Uh, you know, he would be a Democratic version of Trump. And I don't think that any Democratic version of Trump is going to beat the real McCoy. So, <laughs> you know, at this point, I think that Trump has a reasonable chance of winning the election. You say no Democrat version of Trump. The only one I think that could, Dr. Ostrauer, would be Oprah Winfrey, but I think Oprah has kind of ruled it out. My impression is that she has. I mean, you know, certainly if I can speak personally, the idea of having another president, another candidate with no, you know, serious uh, governmental experience is not uh, something that I would look forward to. Uh, uh, you know, I think that Trump is in many ways untutored and un inexperienced, and I think we're going to pay a price for that, a big, big, big price for that, and especially in respect to international affairs. And for Oprah Winfrey, just from my perspective, a huge question mark. I certainly couldn't get excited about a Winfrey, uh, uh, a Winfrey candidacy any more than I think, you know, I was thinking people would get excited about a Cynthia Nixon candidacy for uh, governor. I mean, she also, zero experience. Dr. Gary Ostrar, uh, before we get to uh, the uh, news about uh, NAFTA, uh, could we do a little bit of history? Sure. Okay, uh, just throwing this out there. And, you know, the impressive thing about this is whenever I bring up things like Operation Typhoon, uh, World War II, 1941, off of uh, this day in history, this is the kind of thing I have to uh, do a little research in. I just throw it out to Dr. Ostrauer, and uh, he's, he's got it on the tip of his tongue. Uh, what is Operation Typhoon, Dr. Ostrauer? 
Well, now, wait a minute. Don't, don't assume that I have this on the tip of my tongue. You're talking about a 1941 operation? Yeah, the Germans began their surge to Moscow, led by the 1st Army Group, General uh, Fedor von Bach, uh, and so on and so forth. I'm on the uh, History Channel's page. Okay, uh, I, I'm, I'm not familiar with the term Operation Typhoon. Perhaps I should be. But what I, I, I can tell you is this. In June of 1941, well, let me go back just two years. The war begins in September. The Second World War in Europe begins in uh, September of 1939. Now, remember, I think that we are all too often to, you know, forgetting this. World War II really began in 1937 when the Japanese attacked the Chinese in July of, uh, they attacked Shanghai in, 19, uh, in 1937. And that was an ugly little war. I mean, among other things, for instance, in October of 1937, the Japanese are going to launch the first full-scale aerial attack on a large city, okay? And that was Nanking, uh, where literally hundreds of thousands of people were killed. And uh, that war continues, of course, until 1939. In 1939, in September, the Germans get into it. They attacked uh, Poland, and then uh, England and France uh, declared war on Germany and so forth. For a period, they had what was called the phony war. There really wasn't very much uh, military uh, activity at all until the spring of 1940. And then, of course, I think as most of us know from having seen, for instance, the film Dunkirk, uh, the Germans attacked the uh, the Ger Germans attacked the French. Uh, the British removed their troops at Dunkirk. Uh, about 330,000 troops were uh, uh, were evacuated and whatnot. And that that war continues until 1941, and at that point, in June of 1941, Hitler ordered an attack on the Soviet Union. He ordered an attack on Russia. And it was the largest military attack in world history until that time. 3.05 million German soldiers, and not only German soldiers, some of them were Romanian, a few of them were Italian, uh, they, attacked, uh, they attacked the Soviet Union. And they attacked toward Moscow, mainly toward Moscow. They failed. They failed in part because uh, they had not, they had underestimated the Soviet will to resist. They had underestimated some of the problems they would have with weather. And by November of 1941, the Germans were bogged, bogged down. And they're going to remain bogged down, more or less. There are going to be uh, efforts at, uh, uh, at offense. They are going to be pushed back every so often. Again, in early 1942, they once again attacked Moscow. Uh, they had a fall back. And then, and then what Hitler does is to essentially kind of, how shall I put it, uh, to redirect his efforts, not so much toward Moscow, but toward Stalingrad. And I think he attacked Stalingrad not because it was a really critical area. Uh, it was a transportation center. There was some, uh, uh, there was some uh, you know, uh, military activity, certainly some a lot of industrial activity there. But it wasn't critical. It was much less important, let's say, than Leningrad or than, uh, than, uh, than Moscow. Uh, and there uh, he attacks, and I think in part because of the name of the city. He wanted to humiliate Stalin. It was a way of Hitler, uh, uh, you know, kind of establishing his own dominance over the Soviet, uh, over the Soviet leader at that time, Joseph Stalin. Well, you know, it's going to be the critical battle of the entire war. Uh, the Germans are going to lose in terms of killed and wounded and missing in action over a half million men, well over a half million men. The Soviets, the same thing. Uh, but it blunted the German attack, and the Germans would never again really be on the offensive in the way in which they were uh, during the early and middle parts of 1942. Now, that's a lot of history there, but uh, uh, it, it, it kind of encapsulates uh, the, 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 the key German effort uh, in the early part of the war. Talking to Dr. Gary Ostro, the other big thing that happened in the, uh, this day in history was that uh, Thurgood Marshall was sworn into the Supreme Court. Uh, if we have time to talk about that and trade uh, when we get back uh, the, the NAFTA issue, uh, we will. Going to take a quick break, check the forecast. We'll be back with Dr. Ostrauer in about 90 seconds. Not sure what's going to happen to your current internet provider? Switch to award-winning Empire Access, your local company. Local, reliable, better. Offering the fastest internet in town. They're not going anywhere. Get fiber optic internet and TV for just $65 a month. If you need faster speeds, gigabit internet is available. Empire Access means faster streaming, surfing, and 
gaming. And when you need customer service, you get a live and local representative. Grab all the info and make the switch today at EmpireAccess.com. EmpireAccess.com. Checking in now is meteorologist Rob Carroll, who's got his Make America Great Again hat on just to do the forecast. Weather-wise, Brian, we've got a little bit of rain out there this morning, and some of it's been heavy. I actually had a little bit of thunder and lightning showing up. A uh, line right now stretching from Messina all the way down to about Binghamton and then back to Buffalo. It's associated with a low-pressure system, which is moving across the uh, region. It'll eventually get into Albany later today and then head out through New England, and we'll see somewhat drier weather move in behind it. Rest of the morning and into the afternoon, scattered showers and maybe a thunderstorm. Watch for locally heavy downpours. Temperatures, they'll be close to 70 today. Sunrise this morning was at 7.09. It'll set tonight at 6.49. Tonight, the showers are gone. They end during the evening. Overnight, we're mostly cloudy, 50 to 55. Now, tomorrow looks like it's going to turn into a partly sunny day. Look ahead to Thursday, a mixture of clouds and sun with the chance for a shower or thunderstorm. As another front heads our way. We're going to be warm ahead of that front, 75 to 80. And Brian, look for the temperatures to cool off during the day on Friday. Daytime highs probably only in the 60s behind that front. Thanks, Rob. Now back with uh, Dr. Gary Ostrauer, Alfred University um, history professor. Dr. Ostrauer, b- before we get to the uh, the NAFTA issue, I did want to ask you, when Thurgood, Thurgood uh, Marshall, the first uh, black justice on the Supreme Court, was sworn in uh, back in 1967, did the Southern segregationists uh, make a big deal about that, or were they more quiet uh, after the Civil Rights Act was signed? They were more quiet after the Civil Rights was signed. They were certainly not very enthusiastic about his uh, about his appointment to the court an appointment incidentally that he that probably could not be made today would not be made today in light of uh, you know the partisanship that we have right now um, but uh, yeah it was a very very important moment and it was uh, you know kind of solidified at that time a kind of liberal majority on the Supreme Court eventually of course that's going to turn around and then today we're looking at a conservative majority and with young conservatives that will be on the court for you know quite a long long time maybe 20 30 years or so um, but I would like to talk, if I may, some, you know, to say something about the NAFTA issue. Sure. Because yesterday the president announced that uh, there has been a revision to the NAFTA agreement. You know, he originally called it the worst agreement in world history. Well, that's what he also said about our, uh, the ch- treaty with Iran. But in either case, uh, uh, it has been substantially revised. And I think that you would have to say it's a real victory for President Trump. He bullied the, uh, the Canadians, and I mean really bullied the Canadians, uh, in some, I think, uh, almost disgraceful ways. Uh, that may come back to haunt us later on. Uh, but he got an agreement that I think is going to be very, very favorable to the United States, to a certain extent to American farmers, especially American dairy farmers, and to a certain extent to American auto workers. Because, for instance, uh, the agreement is, uh, says that 40% of all of the automobiles that are going to be brought into the United States, I should say that the automobile, automobiles that are going to be uh, you know, imported into the United States from abroad, from Canada, or perhaps from Mexico, are going to have to have uh, 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 be made by people making at least sixteen dollars an hour. That's going to raise the uh, uh, the uh, uh, the wage rate in Mexico for sure. Uh, I don't think it will have too much effect in Canada per se, uh, but it's going to have the effect of also. Uh, re- requiring uh, a certain percentage of the automobiles to be manufactured in the United States itself. So I don't think there's any question that economically it's going to be you know, very, very fav- favorable to the United States. But I think there's something lost in all of this, and this is where I become much more critical, again, of the president. And that is that the real issue, the real trade issue today, is not with Canada. And it's not with Mexico. Okay, this is going to be a drop in the bucket so far as our trade with those two countries are concerned. The real issue is with China. And I see that right now our relationship with China is deteriorating and deteriorating sharply. And, you know, some people may remember just last week when Trump spoke before the United Nations. Uh, He gave a press conference right after his speech, and he attacked the Chinese for interfering in the American election said nothing about the real issue of interference, which is, of course, the Russians. But he attacked the Chinese. And I think that it symbolizes, I think that in some ways it's a, uh, a precursor of a much more sharply deteriorating relationship between the U.S. and with China. And if that's the case, uh, you know, hang on to your seats, folks, because we're going to have to deal with this for the, you know, 5, 10, 15, 20 years or so. On that topic of things uh, going uh, badly with China, 
Um, things seem to be good at the moment between the U.S. and North Korea. Uh, you don't hear all these stories about uh, missile testings and missiles getting fired uh, towards uh, Japan. Uh, if something does go wrong in that uh, area with, between uh, the U.S. and North Korea, which we hope it doesn't, who would Trump turn to if not China? He has no one to turn to. And that's part of what I was saying before about, you know, what he did with Prime Minister Trudeau in Canada. What Trump is doing is he's kind of broken the rules. And I think a lot of Americans are applauding this. But he's broken the rules of international politics. We've had ever since 1945, from 1945 until 2016, we have had, we have built up relationships, we've established alliances, we established, you know, working cooperative agreements through such things as the World Trade Organization and the United Nations and whatnot, uh, with, with many, many different countries around the world. And he's now broken that. For instance, with the, climate, the Paris Climate Accord, every single country in the entire world is a member, you know, has signed on to that accord. The Americans have withdrawn from that accord. And what that effectively means, in other words, is that we're going it alone. Well, to a certain extent, you know, we might get away with this. For a certain period of time, we might get away with this. But sooner or later, we're going to need alliances. Sooner or later, we're going to need help from other countries. So if, for instance, our relationship with, deteriori with China deteriorates and we need, in respect to North Korea, the support of others, we're simply not going to have it. We're going to be hanging out there by ourselves. And in a very, very complex international world, that is not going to serve our interests. It's just not. And the real issue in the Far East, by the way, the most important issue in the Far East, is not going to be what happens with North Korea. Okay, and by the way, the North Koreans are still manufacturing, they are still developing nuclear weapons. They may not be testing them, but they're manufacturing them. There has apparently been no slowdown whatsoever in that area. So that may also come back to, uh, you know, trouble us. But, you know, the one country that we'd have to count on is not going to be Japan, it's not going to be Taiwan, it's going to be China, and China is not going to be there for us. We've been talking with Alfred University history professor Dr. Gary Ostrar. Dr. Ostrar, as always, thanks for coming on with us. My pleasure on a rainy day. <laughs> day of 1480 WLEA Hornell. Thank you, Gary.